Let's begin. Let me welcome you. Welcome, everybody. Welcome to the Future Trends Forum. I'm delighted to see you here today. We have some terrific guests in a wonderful series talking about the future of higher ed. And I'm really looking forward to our conversation. And this is a special conversation for a lot of reasons. Uh, every so often at the forum, we do a series of themed events. And this is part of a sequence uh, called the Paradigm Conversations. We're partnering with the Paradigm Project, which itself comes out of bringing theory to practice, to have conversations about reforming higher education in a just and equitable way. And we've had three of these so far. And in full disclosure, I'm part of the Paradigm Project Working Group, and some of my colleagues are, are here with us today. But we've been looking at different ways of reforming higher education in a way that is fair, doesn't reproduce historical injustices, and helps the student learning experience. Now, this week, we're going to look at a particular subject under that header, and that is how to connect two different fields within the liberal education, within the liberal arts world. And one of them is career preparation. The other one is civic engagement. Now, these two are often associated with liberal arts and liberal education model. How can we integrate all three? How can we put all this together? Well, with those three topics, we have three great guests. Uh, we have Laura Badeau, Ashley Finley, Paul Schadenwald. I'm really excited uh, to host all of them. So let me just take turns, bring them up on stage one by one, and then we'll start this week's conversation. So to begin with, from Oberlin College, let me bring on stage Professor Laura, Professor and Dean Laura Bodeau. Welcome. <laughs> Thanks, Brian. Very excited to be here. Oh, it's good to see you. Hey, what's uh, what's the uh, engraving behind you? That isn't a uh, Piranesi, is it? It is. Oh, what Ruins, a good guess. appropriate for the conversation. Oh, gosh, I hope not. <laughs> um, um, but but wonderful craft, uh, which is definitely appropriate for the conversation. Um, Laura, I've, I've got to ask, we have a tradition here on the forum of introducing people by asking them what they're working on for the next year. And I, I'm, I'm curious, in terms of our topic this week, in, in your role as, as Senior Associate Dean, what are you going to be working What are the big projects and what are the big concepts that are top of mind for you? Yes, thank you, Brian. So uh, I'll talk about a few things that are that are most germane to the to the conversation today. And let me just first say that everything I'll be talking about is a collaborative endeavor. I'm very fortunate to have amazing, dedicated um, faculty and staff with whom I work. Some of them are, are, are in the session today. So uh, we're very excited this summer to be exploring something we're calling the sophomore existential seminars. So mm. we're developing this faculty in the humanities uh, staff from the Center for Engaged Liberal Arts. We're, we're creating courses or seminars for sophomores that will help them think about meaning and purpose within a broader humanities context. Mm. So, uh, you know, people they're in the vast literature about how to support sophomores, we often talk about how they experience something like an existential crisis, particularly sophomores at institutions like Oberlin where many come in undecided about what they wanna do. Uh, sophomore year, the important rite of passage is to declare a major. So all kinds mm. of questions about my life's meaning and purpose can arise. Um, so we've done a number of things over the years, many of them more or less transactional to help them really start planning, not only for their major and their you know, five semester academic plan within that major, but also how they're gonna bring co-curriculars into support and enrich that major. So the current thinking is let's combine the kind of um, more practical uh, toolkit development, as we call it, of having a CV, five semester curricular, co-curricular plan, uh, mm -hmm. materials for personal statement, combine that with a course that's really thinking in broad ways about the meaning of life through, again, humanities methodologies and texts. So as we know, the humanities are also experiencing a, a, you know, a kind of existential crisis. So part of the goal here is also to help students understand how the humanities help you lead a more meaning filled and purpose-filled life. So um, mm. we're very excited about working on this. The other thing, uh, this is part of preparing sophomores to take full advantage of Internship Plus, which is the kind of signature programming for juniors. Um, and that's uh, $5,000 to support an underpaid or unpaid internship or other kind of pre-professional experience the summer of their junior year. So we really want uh, sophomores to be thinking about how to take 
advantage, full advantage of that opportunity. And we're very excited to build out more research opportunities that mm. kind of cut that that are within and beyond disciplines. So this is where my colleagues mm. in the in the Bonner Center for Community Engaged mm -hmm. uh, Learning, Teaching and Research are doing great work thinking about what it would mean to create a community based research lab within the Bonner Center. How can we get mm -hmm. students to start thinking about what they might want to do in that space their sophomore year? So uh, I have the tremendous good fortune to work with colleagues in experiential learning offices, high impact practices within the Center for Engaged Liberal Arts. So we're very excited to think about research being a way to connect the curriculum and the co-curricular. Now, is, is so that those research... are two big projects. Oh, sorry, they sound, yeah. they sound terrific. I, quick questions, is that research research done by students on, uh, on topics? Yes, yeah, so students and faculty would collaborate on research that you know does capacity building for um, local or global organizations. Excellent, excellent. That sounds terrific, and uh, I love the name. The name of the software is Existential Seminar. What was yes, it called? Yes, Sophomore Existential Seminars. We're just leaning into That's the existential name. crisis dimension of that. Absolutely, of that, that sounds year. fantastic. Uh, well, what a, what a great year for you, and what a, what a great set of ideas for for Oberlin. Well, Thank you. Excellent. Laura, let me let me hang on one second. Let me bring up uh, your two co-panelists and uh, and friends. As we as we do this, start thinking as we introduce folks. Think about what you'd like to ask them and and what you'd like to know. Uh, let me uh, now bring up my friend uh, Ashley Finley, who is coming to us from uh, the American Association of Colleges and Universities, where she is a vice president, and I think she's somewhere maybe in Wisconsin or Minnesota right now. Where have we found you today, Ashley? You have found me in Elkhart, Wisconsin. Indeed, we have. Well, welcome. Glad, a wee glad bit to see north you. of Milwaukee. Uh, indeed, indeed. So, um, what what are you going to be working on for the next year, Ashley? What are, what are the big projects at AAC and U for you? And and what what ideas are going to be uppermost for you? Yeah. Thank you, Brian. Well, just quickly. Uh, amazing to be here. Love this conversation. Love you, Brian. You know I love you. <laughs> I'm um, always, always grateful to be in your presence and go Oberland right on. I yeah. love, I love the sidebar opportunity to open the first existential crisis center. Like you just, <laughs> for everybody to to Oberland. I love it. Love it. Um, I'm this, the timing is really wonderful, both for, for me to join you in this conversation and for us to be having this conversation. We have just launched a new office at AACNU that I'm overseeing called the office of research and public purpose. And mm. that office will bring together um, three three elements that I think when we think about higher education, we recognize that this is where higher education benefits the public good. Uh, there's the kitty. I was waiting for the kitty to show up. Um, she must have but, been. but if we were if we were going to think about like how does how does higher education serve the greater good, I think we'd identify at, at least these three areas, which is community engagement, community involvement, career preparation and holistic well-being. And mm. so this office is intended to bring together in conversation those three elements. I have benefited greatly in my career from having the pleasure of working with Bringing Theory to Practice. So I owe them a huge amount of credit for expanding my thinking on this way back when, when I was a, an early faculty member. And I and I'm so excited that AACNU has recognized what it means to put these elements into dialogue. So effectively recognizing what it means for institutions to be transparent about the mm. interconnectedness of community, economic, and individual thriving. Excellent. So, yeah, Excellent. That, that's now, where we're going. Well, that's a that's a big project. Is, is that going to be a virtual center or is it going to be physically based somewhere? So, I mean, AACNU has, has been remote since the pandemic. We do have a building in DC, but this this will be an actual program office. So it is an office mm -hmm. built to encapsulate it, it. And actually right now it'll hold a portfolio of work that I've already been working on and doing, including, I'll add, a curriculum to career institute that we've been running for the last uh, couple of years. And we're taking a pause on that in 2024, but we'll be back with it in 2025. So I would say anybody out there that's interested in thinking about that work, um, we have a Lumina grant right now. Thank you, Lumina Foundation. We're working on a curriculum to career implementation project with 12 campuses, really understanding what it means, as, just as Laura was saying so wonderfully, what does it mean to really embed purpose and meaning? 
um, mm. within, within and across the disciplines in ways that help students to envision a range of career paths, not just a single job, but like, but just a range mm -hmm. of career paths. And really thinking about that authentic connection with the disciplines is, is core to the work. So I'm, I'm super excited about it. Oh, that sounds fantastic. Uh, when, I mean, where does it stand today? I mean, is it, is it formally open or are you, are, is there a soft announcement coming up or? There, so we're we're in motion right now with our Lumina grant project with our 12 campuses. So that's happening right now. So we're studying effectively what does it take to implement this work? And you know, no no shock that a lot of them have faculty fellows that they're working with and really, mm -hmm. really tapping faculty as ambassadors to think about where these intersections are. Um, in 2025, as we get into the new year, we'll be opening up um, the application process to come to the Curriculum to Career Innovations Institute. So we'll be re rerunning that again. And we'll we'll infuse some programming through like the annual meeting for ACNU and then mm -hmm. we'll be mm -hmm. um, into the spring with our general education conference as well. So just keep an eye out. We're sending Actually, I, 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 I would love to have you uh, uh, come back um, uh, at some point, perhaps with some of the faculty fellows or however you structure it um, right. to to talk about that particular work. Anytime. Anytime. Well, welcome. Um, and well, here, Ashley, it's good to see you. Let me add to us, uh, to the uh, third member of our panel, uh, my friend Paul Schadewald, who is coming to us with a very, very fine background. Uh, I mean, a literal background, because um, he has the uh, United Nations uh, Sustainable Development Goals on the wall behind him. Um, <laughs> and can you hear me OK, Brian? Perfectly, Paul. Can you hear us? Yeah, I certainly can. It's great to be here. Oh, I'm so glad you could join us. And uh, I really appreciate your work on, on helping make this panel possible. Um, Paul, we, we were talking about how to introduce you, and, and we came up with a, a slight twist in our usual pattern. Um, you've been working with Bring Theory to Practice, and you're a key part of the Paradigm Project. Now, I'm curious, looking ahead for the next year, how does the topic we're talking about, this integration of career preparation and civic engagement within liberal education, how does that connect to your work uh, as it unfolds in the Paradigm Project? Sure, sure. Um, well, first of all, thanks, Brian, for the great uh, collaboration that Future Trends Forum is having with Bringing Theory to Practice. Um, right now, the main project that Bringing Theory to Practice is working on is the Paradigm Project, which is supporting transformative education uh, to advance equitable, engaged, holistic education at the center. And we're doing this in a number of different ways, including trying to urge um, the de-siloization uh, within higher education, trying to create a collaborative ecosystem within higher oh. education itself, trying to help uh, higher education institutions become learning organizations, and, um, and also trying to change the narrative of higher education. So really, the, like the topic of this panel really lands squarely in both the mission of, of the Paradigm Project as well as our change strategies. Because you can imagine how desiloization and changing the narrative about what higher education is, helping us really be more collaborative, how this really gets at the heart of today's conversation. And I would have to say it's something really close to my heart as well. Like I'm sure a lot of people in our audience either are familiar with or maybe some of them have participated in um, the round of Lilly Foundation grants that were given to a lot of higher education institutions really in the first decade of, of this century. And yeah. for me, was incredibly personally transformative and it was really transformative for educations as a whole. And those Lilly Foundation grants really spoke to some of the same things that Ashley just mentioned now, but was really thinking about as higher education institutions, how do we put vocation, purpose, meaning at the center of what we do and link areas that aren't aren't uh, necessarily linked together to help students really imagine their own futures. And I was working at McAllister College at the time, which wasn't, which is in covenant with the Presbyterian Church, but it wasn't an overtly religious uh, higher education yeah. institution. So for us, our, our real conversation was around how do you answer these questions about meaning, purpose, 
and vocation in a way that we weren't necessarily being exclusively religious, but you know, but broad. And that brought us to a lot of the same themes, or at least brought me to a lot of the same themes that we're wrestling with with, with the Paradigm Project right now. That a lot of times our career development center, our academics, our civic engagement center were not just separate in, in, in offices, but they were separate physically. Like literally they were physically apart from one another. They were also apart in terms of relationships. Like a lot of times the thickest relationships weren't among these that were really helping to create this holistic education, but were separate. And I think most importantly, they weren't necessarily connected in kind of their roles or their thinking about what does it mean to work in higher education. And I think for wow. that time, I was able to kind of see how these three different elements could all work together and make the, the whole greater than the sum of the parts. So the liberal arts, which McAllister at that time, you know, really was core in, it had, it, it, it wasn't inconsequential to these kinds of questions. It was central to it in terms of really helping people understand uh, a well-lived life, to understand the human experience, to understand being able to be critical of society. But then uh -huh. community engagement or civic engagement, social responsibility made you take those questions out into the messiness of the real world and help people enter into that with a sense of humility and a sense that people can't do this work alone. Um, and the sense of you need to be able to do things in the world. And then the career or vocational path, as Ashley just mentioned, thinking that the good isn't refined to like one sector and that you weren't selling out, but how do you bring the good into that workplace? And also knowing that work may not be the center of, of your life. How do you live a well-lived life? And so we built connections among one another and this is also central to the Paradigm Project. We're asking questions about student thriving, but in asking questions about student thriving, we're also asking deeper questions about what's the purpose of our institutions and what about staff and faculty thriving? So when we started to ask what are helping students answer these questions of meaning and purpose, invariably staff and faculty were asking themselves, I went into this profession, this location, what does it mean for me to be a, a college professor or an academic staff member and to build relationships with one another? So transitioning to the Paradigm Project, Randy Bass, your colleague, has challenged us to think about this kind of set of questions as a threshold question, this kind of question about careers and vocation and our responsibility to the public as questions that every higher education institution is asking themselves. And so we have to ask ourselves that as we're trying to support transformative education out there. How can we answer these questions and answer it in a way that has integrity, that, ha that lands for students, and that helps student thriving, staff and faculty thriving, and that inevitably may lead us to more transformative forms of education and new relationships, new structures, not only for us, but maybe a new story about higher education at this moment that will land wow. for people. Wow. Well, that's a fantastic answer to my to my prompt. I, I've got to say, Paul, and it, it seems like already we have some emerging themes from from what I've seen of the three of you today, uh, including the sense of liberal arts immersed in the broader world, perhaps through existential questions of of how do we survive and how do we make meaning in the world, um, but also how we do this, including career preparation, and how this is intertwined with the classic academic function of of the liberal arts. Let me let me just quickly rearrange the screen here a little bit so that it's uh, a, a little more comfortable. Um, and uh, and for those of you who have just joined us for the past couple of minutes, welcome. Uh, good to see you all. Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask our guests just a couple of quick questions to give them a chance to unfold even more of their thought. Um, but as they answer and as I query them, please think about what you'd like to ask them about this topic. How can we integrate civic engagement and workforce preparation within the liberal arts? Uh, I think you will have a whole bunch of questions in, in response to them. And I, I guess my first question is a kind of, uh, I guess, a, a, a negative or a photo negative question. When people hear liberal education or when they hear the liberal arts, they often think about that to mean the humanities by itself. But also, I think they tend to, it, they tend to assume it means a kind of uh, retreat from the world, things that are not engaged with the material surroundings of academia. In fact, that they partake of our unique space in higher education where we can pursue curiosity, where we have the time protected space in order to be able to learn, research and develop. Uh, there's, there's also there's a sense sometimes that the career preparation is to 
um, to material, uh, that it may degrade or restrict our abilities to have that kind of curiosity, that kind of intellectual development. And we look at civic engagement. Um, sometimes higher education as a whole is predicated on the opposite idea, that we have, again, that safe space where we can we, we can do our intellectual work apart from the pressures of, uh, of the civic world. Um, how how can how can we answer those those objections? How can we how can we do this work and still be in the liberal tradition? Now I'm putting this to the three of you. So whoever wants to go first, please feel free. Or if you just want to say, point to Laura and say, Laura, you answer. Well, I'm, well, I'm happy to st I'm happy to start, Brian. Uh, that's a really great and rich question. I do think there's less resistance at least on the part of faculty to this idea that career preparation isn't part of what we do. I think mm. that kind of binary learning for the sake of learning and preparing students for professions or a sense of vocation, that, that we're kind of post that binary. Um, mm. But I do think mm. particularly for the, the, the humanities, there's still a sense of, you know, what, what, is, what is the purpose of disciplinary knowledge? Uh, particularly mm. in fields that don't have obvious careers outside of academia. So um, I think with, um, you know, at Oberlin, we have, for the humanities, um, for example, thought about how we can uh, open up possibilities through public humanities. So we have what we call integrative concentrations, which are essentially minors with required experiential learning. So students, uh, and the integrative piece is a digital portfolio where they're thinking about how theory and practice work together. So public humanities is a great example of thinking about the value of, as you're saying, retreat from the world, uh, solitude, all the ways in which we, we feed our inner lives as being pretty essential to our, our capacity to be uh, um, civically engaged, to, right. to give our talents to others. The, you know, the, the, it's always about thinking about the balance between self and other and the needs of the self, the well-being of the self depends on a certain kind of solitude. So, um, but the public humanities show students that their capacity to talk about literature um, is actually, or art or whatever it is, that those conversations, like the conversations you host, Brian, conversations are essential uh, for the ability of art to um, participate in social justice. So I'll just say one other thing about how uh, Paul mentioned the importance of co-locating and bringing experiential offices together. So at Oberlin, we're very fortunate that our experiential learning offices are, or our high impact practice areas, mm -hmm. uh, global education, uh, undergraduate research, the Bonner Center, entrepreneurship, et cetera, digital portfolio are in one place together. And the place is actually very important symbolically because it's the ground level of the library. So it's mm. a perfect mm. kind of uh, um, enactment of the relationship between the life of the mind, depth, retreat from the world, and action. So I, I see that that you know co-location as bringing the third element of a liberal arts education, which is relevance, making that point that it's about depth, breadth, and relevance. So I think you know the shorter answer here is I think we're post that resistance. It's not mm -hmm. whether, but how. So, you know, I think the work mm -hmm. we're doing is how do we create these connections for students and between faculty and staff? Thank you, thank you. That, that's really well said, Laura. I, I, Ashley, Paul, would you like to add to that? I'll, I'll pick up on uh, something that occurred to me as, as Paul was talking uh, about the, the kinds of questions that they've been invited to, to ask and to respond to the threshold kinds of questions. That, something that came to my mind is how did we let this get separated in the first place <laughs> so so if you go back to the original documents of the moral act and even the truman commission uh -huh. report right two uh -huh. fundamental documents in which we might cite both expansion of higher education in very particular ways right the creation of the land-grant institutions and the creation and the call for community colleges in both of those documents there is very clear and i would say inspiring language around the connection between a practical and a liberal education that the only way for democracy to actually function is to bring those two things in concert together they both say them in their particular way but the language is incredible and it's an incredible reminder of how 
to pick it up, like those elements of economic and individual thriving married with community thriving are the ways that people will function and thrive, thrive communally and thrive in their lives and how we how we create a, a better and more just society. So so one of the questions I have is how do we let those get separated in the first place? And I'm yeah. sure there's some evolution of the disciplines and the professional societies, and, uh, et cetera, et cetera, that that's a bit to blame there. But so I, I offer this. Right. So you take a bookend of you know, 1800s and then mid mid uh, 1900s too with the commission report. Um, but I'd add to it what we've found in our most recent uh, employer data from AAC and you. So both in 2021 uh -huh. and in 2023, we found for the first time a significant trend difference between employers under the age of 40 and employers over the age of 50. And the basis uh -huh. of that trend difference was the employers under the age of 40s valuing of community engaged experiences. Mm -hmm. And we are talking not small differences, we are talking magnitudes of 10 to 20, even 30 percentage point differences wow. between those age groups in how they are valuing both the purpose of what higher education is meant to do, what it means to be well-rounded, and mm -hmm. what it means, what kinds of outcomes and experiences they value at far higher rates than employers over the age of 50. Now, what's interesting about that, I mean, it's just interesting on its face, but what's yeah. also interesting about that is considering the fact that those employers under the age of 40 are the oldest millennials. We might genuinely be seeing a generational shift in what is valued in the workplace. So think mm -hmm. about the implications for corporate and social responsibility within yeah. workplaces. Think about a, a whole generation of employers that is thinking through the lens of their clients and customers voting with their dollars. Uh -huh. so, so the time is absolutely now for, for campuses to be leaning into what this connection might be and how to explore it more intensively. I think exactly the way both Laura and Paul have described it, described it and really like thinking about what those alliances look like, thinking mm -hmm. about what that collaboration can look like. I will, I will joke, I'll, I'll end with this and move it over to Paul, but I joke sometimes about, we've long been talking about the collaboration between academic affairs and student affairs. So I feel like we're now at a point where at least academic affairs and student affairs feel guilty for not, <laughs> for, for not working together. I don't think it's ever even entered the minds of the career center people and the civic engagement people that they ought to be working together. I don't even think that's entered their minds. And I think we, wow. we got to plant those seeds. Wow. Well, well, thank you for that great answer. Just a, as a side note, friends, a, a few of us have been talking over the past couple of years about doing a special forum series on important historical documents in, in higher education history. So if, you know, taking a look at the moral grant, um, you know, laws, the two of them, if you want to talk about the Truman Commission, if you're interested in that, please let me know. I'd, I'd be glad to set that okay. up. Thank you, Ashley, for that inspiring answer um, and a very liberal arts answer, I should say, as well. Uh, Paul, would you like to chime in on this? Sure. Um, yeah, so I, I can take this in a, a few different directions. Um, so, you know, I think, sure, there will be probably some people who will have a view of the liberal arts that they need to have some sort of sense of purity. But I think there's so much to be gained. Um, I, I don't have that view, but so much to be gained when we put all the great things about the liberal arts, the wonderful things about the liberal arts, the criticism, the, the understanding of human experiences and connect that to the messiness of the real world. So I don't know, Brian, if you're going to be sharing a button with some of our links or if we should put that in the chat. But, you know, I think a couple of the a couple of the folks who have really influenced me and I know have influenced the Paradigm Project, you know, William Sullivan's essay on Only Connect. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm thinking about that the liberal arts and kind of the, the liberally educated person, the person who's educated for freedom as having that ability to connect with lots of different people in lots of different ways. Um, you know, I think that some of the things that we'd be talking about that kind of intertwine people thinking, students especially thinking about their vocation, their future, thinking about their responsibilities to the world and thinking about like really the liberal arts, which, you know, is, is, you know, is a source of love, thinking about those three connections with one another. Um, you know, some of those are just the most rich experiences and you can gain so much from that interconnection, the experiences of humility, 
the experience of valuing different kinds of knowledge. So the academic knowledge, but also the knowledge that community members have and struggling with, how do you reconcile and connect these different kinds of epistemologies, these different kinds of knowledges? Um, how do you wrestle with that? This idea of going into an unscripted situation where you don't have all the answers, it's not just memorizing something on a book, but really you're having to draw from your personal experience, your academic knowledge, what you're learning just by walking through the world and coming up with things. Those are the kind of skills and the kind of pathway uh, navigation kind of tools uh, that people are going to be using throughout their throughout their whole lives. And I feel like that's what's gained by really wrestling with the inner like the interconnection among um, among these three things. The other um, I would say the other person I've really been influenced by is, is, is William Sullivan, who's done a lot of work on the civics and the professions. And he's really pointed out about how people as part of their education needs an apprenticeship of knowledge, an apprenticeship of skills to be able to get things done in the world, um, and, in a, and an apprenticeship of purpose for us to like be able to step back and make meaning from the things we're doing. And all of this is in service to a sense of practical wisdom. And that larger sense of practical wisdom of not knowing, not knowing things, not only knowing how to do things, but really knowing the why and asking yourself about the larger meaning of as we're doing things about knowing what things to do and what things not to do. I mean, talk about a gift that our students could bring no matter what profession they're in, whether it's government, nonprofit, business, but to have that kind of reflection of being able to do things draw on their knowledge, but also to be able to step back and understand why they're doing it and asking these kind of larger questions. I think that's at the core of the liberal arts and that's what can be uh, cultivated by putting these three areas into conversation and wrestling uneasily together. Oh, oh nice. Well, wrestling uneasily is what we do here. And that sounds wrong. That sounds right. I, 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 I mean, that's, that's, that's so well said. I mean, Paul, Ashley, Laura, what a, what a terrific set of answers to this question. Uh, I was going to ask more questions, but uh, the the audience is already barraging me with questions, and I want to give them the chance to, to ask first. Um, and this is one from a former student of mine, the awesome uh, Rachel Humphreys, who wants to know right now, uh, how are we defining civic engagement in this conversation? She asks, quote, isn't, whoop, excuse me, um, isn't that already part of what we're doing? Um, isn't that, hang on a second. Um, isn't much of the purpose of education to become an informed and capable citizen of contribution to the communities you're a part of? Yes. Everyone just nods and says yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, yeah. that's, that's, do, do we, um, well, go ahead, Ashley. Ashley, I know this is important. Well, for actually, I think, I, Laura, I want to let you in here. Well, I, I was just going to say, um, yes, I, I agree with that definition. It's kind of picking up on something Paul said, too, about how we can um how civic engagement so by that i mean working with community partners actually going out in the world and doing work in service of community expressed needs um, but that is very helpful for students in moving from a tendency that um i see among uh, students which is to stay with critique or stay with problematizing so it's how do we get them to move from problematizing, which is so important, which is part of critical thinking, which is a re very important um, uh, skill that the humanities and humanistic social sciences and other disciplines impart. But how do students go from that to actually making change, to, to using or employing practical wisdom? So in this, I'm very influenced by Ibu Patel's We Need to Build, which is mm -hmm. really about how are we training students to actually once they get a seat at the table, what are they going to do in these unscripted, very complex situations? Oh, that's some, someone I've been trying to bring on the forum for about a year now. <laughs> you should. Yeah, that, it's amazing work. I, I, I love this. I love the definition that Rachel raised. I think that that's spot on. I also love that she just raised the question because it's it's such an important one about language. And we are in the process right now at AACNU of updating our essential learning outcomes, which came out in 2007. So congrats to us. We're now that campus that hasn't updated their learning outcomes in 15 years. So uh, it's time. Um, and I, and I, in the most 
probably right and but no shock to anyone on the screen is the most contested terrain is how do how do we navigate around personal and social responsibility in 2023 in ways that's very different than 2007 mm -hmm. so so that that said is one i think so we've been thinking a lot about what that language is and and so this and even in the open ended comments from from the public from the member and database survey that we did of just sort of querying people like what language are you using here very specific responses of i work with community and partners but i don't do civic work mm -hmm. right so this is really very wow. particular lens that can that arrives when we talk about civic yeah. engagement and it's seen only through a political lens or a voting behavior lens or this must just be a, a voting registration drive how is this connected to the work i do within my business courses where we're doing a lot of internships so language matters. I'm not going to fall on one side or the other on that equation. I just think language really matters. The thing I would offer, though, and I do think it's provocative for, for this kind of a conversation and for any campus, is to think how narrowly civic and community engagement is likely to be defined on their campus. So again, rarely bringing in conversation, internships, clinical practices, field work, community-based research, service learning, study abroad, Often these all sit as silos within campuses, but if we're really committed to what community community and or civic engagement means, we'd bring that into tighter dialogue. We'd really explore what the career and community connections are among those pieces and how they contribute to students' sense of their own purpose and meaning for who they wanna be beyond graduation. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. yeah, and I know this is just echoing what they both said. I know that just thinking about from a structural standpoint, there are some offices, I'm sure, on your campuses, other, you know, other campuses that you may visit that may have people responsible for helping to facilitate or carry on parts of this mission. And sometimes they might be called um, you know, community engagement offices, sometimes civic response, you know, civic engagement, sometimes offices of social responsibility. Um, so, you know, kind of navigating that, it may reflect legacy language, it may reflect actual functions, but I think like the larger purpose is, I mean, for me anyway, is really trying to de-silo and create um, like a lens almost to view the world. Um, you know, so one is the de-siloing to try to think about how do we connect the academics to this so that people can see that connection? How do we make connections yeah. on campus so that when students are in wellness programs or whatever, that they can feel a sense of belonging, not just on campus, but a sense of belonging in the community of which they're, of which they're part, so that they know the community, that they're oriented to it. Um, and also that lens, that, that it's something that, um, that's tied to the mission of a college and that it's a lens that can be brought to different, different Academic uh, academic mission. It can be brought to the student affairs mission, and then the de-siloing between higher education itself and the surrounding community mm -hmm. to really think about how do we build relationships and learn from one another and model that for students. We had um, a, a few years ago. We had uh, as a guest the wonderful Kathleen Fitzpatrick, now at uh, Michigan State University, and she had a beautiful book uh, about um, uh, building kind of porous university boundary between the, the bound community, uh, between the two communities, uh, which which is great. I Thank you uh, for, for answering this question. Of course, Rachel, it's great to see you uh, since you do so much great work in civic education. Thank you for the question. We have a, a kind of follow-up question. If, for whoever wants to tackle this, I think, Ashley, I think you did just touch on this a little bit. Uh, this is uh, and this is from uh, uh, Dean uh, Christopher Nelson, who says, "What does civic light engagement look like today when no one is willing to listen to another?" Uh, and, and actually, you, you mentioned it's very different now than it was in say 2007 or 2010. Yeah. Did you have anything? Would anyone like to add to that uh, sharpening that civic engagement in this time? I'll add. I'll add one piece, Brian which is the brightest through line that we have seen through our research at AAC New, both with essential learning outcomes, the work, the background work on that. We also did message testing about a couple of years ago. And if anybody's looking for the report, it's not out yet. It's internal. We're still working and getting it out. Uh, anyway, people I know, were right? asking about it. Plus, as soon as I say this, you're gonna be like, ah. Um, but we did some message testing with a general population of adults 
around message testing within like higher education? What are these four, like what are the messages that resonate across these four areas? Skill development, economic thriving, democratic engagement and individual thriving. So we message test like four major themes in those areas. In the, in the higher education's commitment to democracy, the brightest through line, literally the only point of any consensus, it was the most, the most non-consensus of any of the four areas. The one thing was um, speaking and listening across difference. Mm -hmm. And when we get to the essential learning outcomes, also the brightest, the brightest outcome that had the most consensus around it. I would say if what I could 90% sure we will add to the new list of essential learning outcomes is something around speaking and listening across difference. Mm -hmm. It is, it is non it is a nonpartisan stance. We know this from our morning consult research on the message testing, and it seems to have the most consensus. So that's kind of a great win, but exactly to this point wow. of as we care about what civic and community engagement mean, as we care about getting students into community and working with community partners, it will be just as important to make sure we're equipping them with the skill to actually listen and have a conversation mm -hmm. with other people. I think that's something we kind of left as implicit, right? Like we assume yeah. they'll be able to interact and they'll have good enough social skills to navigate the situation. <laughs> we got to get serious about that it's it's clearly something that people actually believe we do and can do well so that's that's a good i i don't know anybody who would say the opposite that you know we're we, we have too much communication across difference right, <laughs> right. right. <laughs> and you know also oh can i mention oh, one thing brian you know uh, one yeah. way to get at that too and i'm you know like the dialogue across difference like super essential, but also, um, you know, I'm taken by also kind of the notion that people come together around shared projects they care about, and especially mm -hmm. if they have a if they have a stake in something. So, you know, one way to foster that kind of listening and and dialogue is through listening and dialogue, and like training people to be humble, training people to listen. Another, you know, another way is is around some of this project based work where people are working side by side with people who are very unlike them, but they're side by side because they care about a project, or at least they could see common stakes, common stakes in the success of a project. So that's where kind of, I think, community engagement and civic engagement, there is a, you know, there's a rich texture to that. And it has implications also for the career realm too, that, um, you know, people being able to walk, you know, work with the complex team to move ahead a project, um, you know, really also is very similar to what what's going to be required of people in a, in, in a workplace setting eventually too. So, it's it's great for democracy, for community, and for and for the workplace. Well, thank you. Uh, th this is great, um, and it makes me automatically think of a climate change project. But uh, yeah. just just quickly in in the chat, um, folks have been adding a whole bunch of references and footnotes. Just people in the chat, if if I can get to post this uh, online. Uh, would you mind if I post this chat record online? I, I would anonymize you and and edit it lightly. But just in the chat, let let me know because this is this is terrific. Uh, Marina Kim has been talking about the philanthropy for active civic engagement project. Uh, we have uh, uh, someone here. I want to say it was Carolyn uh, talking about. Uh, no, Amanda was mentioning at Bryn Mawr College. They have a civic and career engagement center, which is which is just terrific. Uh, but I want to make sure we get to our, all of our questions. So we're going to pick up the pace a little bit now. Uh, and this is one from um, the uh, Vice Provost, uh, Ken O'Donnell at uh, California State University, Dominguez Hills. And he asks, how do we communicate these deep values of liberal learning to first gen or skeptical students? They may sound rarefied or elite to those whose families make big sacrifices for the degree learner, mm -hmm. the degree earner, excuse me. Mm -hmm. yeah. Leave it to Ken to ask an easy question. Ken, such a softball. Well, I, I'm happy to jump in here with one idea. So I think this is where research can be very helpful. Research as an activity that really, I think, speaks to uh, worries about professions and careers while also speaking to academic audiences. And so having, um, having that, I think there's nothing else to to help students understand how amazing an experience and humbling an experience it is to be part of the conversation in a field and to be someone who can actually contribute uh, knowledge in an area. So this is, I think, one of the ways also to cultivate that capacity to listen is hearing what other people, you know, in 
a research field are saying, being part of that conversation. And it does, I think more and more, we see this with kind of online programs for high school students, more and more students understand the real career impact of doing research. So this seems to me like, um, like a way to translate between liberal learning and career preparation for skeptical uh, audiences mm -hmm. of all kinds. Mm -hmm. I, I, I love that point. And, mm -hmm. and as in my, in my portfolio, working with research all the time, right, I can put up, I, I totally agree. And Georgetown Center for Education, the workforce has some of the best data out there. So I highly recommend that as a resource, but I can put up bar graph after bar graph. And as soon as I put up a quote from a student, or maybe from an alum, that's when people lean in. And so I'm ah. also I'm also wondering and wow. thinking about uh, I think a lot about the cold hard hard marketing, <laughs> you know yeah. the unapologetic marketing and branding that goes along mm -hmm. with actually conveying to students that this work matters. And I think about the the ability of campuses to tap their alums to tell mm -hmm. the story of how they made sense of Gen Ed later, how that factors into their careers. Find your find that English major, find that philosophy major who now is wow. like the corporate exec or runs a nonprofit. Um, the way this I, I have I've long said that we don't do a great job of storytelling in higher education. And it's probably for a really long it's probably because for a really long time we didn't have to tell our story. Everybody mm -hmm. just trusted us. And those days are gone. So not only do we need to tell stories, we need to tell them better than ever. And I think we have the ability, but, but the benefit, the opportunity here is leveraging media, social media, and the easy technology tools like an iPhone to actually record those stories and to start making them way more visible than we have before. So I'm, I'm thinking in response to, to Ken's question, Ken and I've worked with similar populations of students. It's so important to tell the story and it's so important to tell them from a vantage point of someone with credibility Mm -hmm. Someone is looked up to by those first gen families, and that's often faculty and or employers. So putting those people as as the as the focal point, um, as the mouthpiece for some of these values could could be huge and powerful. This is this is great. Uh, this is Paul. Paul go, go ahead. Uh, Can I, we, we, yeah, and I'll just I'll just make this really quick, too. I think this the storytelling that uh, Ashley mentioned is also essential to the paradigm project too. And we want to get in a situation we, like we want to push back against the situation of saying that the liberal arts or these kinds of other things are only set for a certain kind of student and that, you know, and that vocational training is for a certain kind of students. We want to be able to capture, you know, the stories in, in all of the richness, the, like the, like, you know, what the liberal arts does, what, what vocational outcomes there are. And also, um, I might point to some programs that do a nice job of integrating these, for example, like the Bonner program. So they have a lot of success at working with first gen students, mm -hmm. um, intertwining career capacity building group cohort. Mm -hmm. um, and one of your guests from last time um, at San Francisco mm -hmm. State, the Metro State program, uh, mm -hmm. Metro Studies program, thinking about how you take students who are coming from first gen backgrounds, giving them a social justice lens to really see a lot of mm -hmm. their studies, but also having great professional and career outcomes to that. So kind of holding up some of these models might be helpful as well. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Excellent. There's a there's a bunch of models coming up in the chat, by the way. So I'm, I'm really looking forward to being able to share those. And uh, again, perhaps this is something where we can do uh, some more programming on, on the forum. Uh, we have uh, a couple of great questions coming in. And this is from our friend uh, Karen Belnier, who's director of digital innovation at Mitchell College. Uh, and she asked a very, very strategic question. Uh, following up on the idea that we are past the resistance of incorporating career preparation or real world relevance into the curriculum, is there a specific turning point or catalyst to that change? I, I, I want to say the 2008 financial crisis, <laughs> um, uh, but but maybe or, or perhaps more recently uh, you know, the economic chaos of 2020. But um, would would you all see any? I mean, I'm thinking of the macro picture. Would you see any other big picture event like that, or would you see a typical event happening on campuses in particular? I think I want to understand the question. I, I interpret it oh, sure. as like, what's a catalyst on campus? Is there a specific frame or a catalyst to, oh, to that change? So you do mean like a specific time period, Karen, that might have motivated that? No, oh, I, think, I think either way. And Karen, <laughs> if you want to add more, please, please feel free. 
I, I have one one thought. I mean, besides like <laughs> the sense that um, of the pending apocalypse. So I think one, uh, you know, lots of schools are kind of orienting the, their the curriculum less around <laughs> disciplines and more around wicked problems or global challenges. So mm, I think true. that orientation to the curriculum has has just, you know, kind of <laughs> automatically shifted this sense of learning for the sake of learning to career prep because you're you're developing the skills to have a career that will actually you know basically salvage the planet humanity so i think the crisis in the world globally has helped to shift but i'm going to defer to ashley who's a historian <laughs> up here this is speculation on my part it's what i've seen in terms of our own curriculum with the new studies <laughs> model that's more about wicked problems. I think that sounds right. I mean, I think the, the you know, the twin triple pandemics, mm -hmm. health, economic, racial justice, you know, social justice. I, yeah. I, I yeah. just think there's something about even that, that brought three really specific things into context with each other, that that combined with uh, declining public opinion, uh, declining public trust in higher ed mm -hmm. institutions. Again, I just don't think we have the luxury anymore of not talking about return on investment. I think it's on colleges and universities not to think that that's gross. Mm -hmm. yeah. Not to think yeah. that mm -hmm. that's such an imposition that we've been placed in and really take it as an opportunity to tell mm -hmm. to tell what it is we do because we really do believe in what we do mm -hmm. we do believe it's valuable and frankly there's tons of statistics to indicate that it's valuable from Georgetown Center on Education the workforce to what we know about students level of civic engagement we know a higher education benefits people it's just time we have to tell that story mm -hmm. Can I add just a tiny little thread to um, what I've seen too is faculty members and especially a new generation of faculty members, many of them from backgrounds that were unlike some of the faculty members who may be there, also helping to drive this uh, somewhat too. And also their own, uh, I think, sense in some ways, especially with the wicked problems questions and stuff for some faculty members of wanting to be relevant in the world and wanting to recapture their own passion for why they <laughs> why they got into this work to begin with. So I look at the concentrations at my former uh, institution, McAllister College in food, agriculture and studies, global mm. health, human rights and humanitarianism, great faculty members leading this and also some of them coming in with their own concerns and passions that just match up really well with this sort of intertwining of career, vocation, uh, community engagement. And they find a sense of meaning from this and the students do as well. Well, that's that's terrific. I, I, I love how we're grounded so carefully in specific campuses and as well as the whole, the whole sector. Um, we're just about out of time, but we've got one great question. And I think maybe <laughs> answering, that, answering that question would give us a way to wrap up. Um, and this is from uh, a brilliant student, a former student of mine uh, named uh, Salvo Lu Levis, who uh, he puts it, well, I don't want to summarize it. It's actually a, a two-step question. You'll, you'll, you'll see what I mean. Here's the, here's the first part. Uh, how do you think about the various stakeholders in trying to outline a future for higher education, for liberal education? I'm thinking at a minimum, students, professors, administration, parents, government, industry. Um, then he goes on to say, I know it's a lot, but perhaps speak to how you see the mutual understanding among those actors bearing on the success of any vision. Mm -hmm. So let, let's, let's use that as a wrap up. I mean, what are, are, what are you seeing in terms of bringing all those stakeholders together for a vision of liberal education that does integrate job preparation along with civic engagement? I'll, I'll jump in because I'm so also so excited to see Salvo's name pop up. Great, you're right, Brian. Brilliant, brilliant, brilliant former student. Um, I so I'm. I would say, it's it's about a shared vision of what the outcomes are for a future that does not exist. This is this is the tie that binds. We know that there are so many things that didn't exist a decade ago. So many changes in our world, a pandemic, forms of transportation, um, the ways in which we have a, a whole bunch of complexities and economic opportunity equipping ourselves and preparing students for a future that does not exist is the way that we find the connecting points among those stakeholders. Mm. 
I, of course, appreciate the future-oriented response. Thank you, Ashley. This is, this is great. Uh, Laura, do you want to chime in? I, I, I affirm Ashley's statement. That's just beautiful. Excellent. Excellent. I'll just I'll just affirm Ashley as well. <laughs> well, thank you, thank you. Um, I think that's a splendid way to to wrap up. I, I I hate to 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 end things, but but we are out of the hour, and we've had a fantastic conversation so far. I, I want to thank each of you, uh, Laura, Ashley, and Paul for for contributing so much to our understanding. Um, let, let me just quickly ask, what's the best way for everybody here to keep up with you and your work? Uh, let me just start off with Laura. How? What's the best way? Do we follow you on LinkedIn or do we follow you um, on on Twitter or on Mastodon? How do we keep up with you? I, I confess to no social media presence, uh, but I I love getting emails. Oh, very good. So very my good. Well, an email address. Excellent. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. And uh, and Ashley, how about yourself? I, I'm with Laura. I'm with Laura on this, but you can find me on LinkedIn. I will respond to that. And good old fashioned email is terrific. Very, very good. Very good. And Paul, how about yourself? Yeah. Uh, well, first of all, Brian, should I put the the link? I'm not sure to the to the document that we all co created in the chat. No, um, I, I already, I already I put you already it there did. Once. I'll okay. Put it there again. Okay. Um, so that has the the website for bringing theory to practice. It has our framework, which is guided uh, bringing theory to practice, as well as an article by David Scobie, our director, as well as the websites for Oberlin, for AACNU. Um, so I think those are the easiest, easiest ways. And I am addicted to social media, like big time <laughs> addicted. So I think I'm an outlier here. So uh, I'll try to reform myself and become more like <laughs> Ashley and Laura. No, 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 no. It's, it's good to see you online. It's good to see you online. Um, and it's, it's, it's wonderful to have seen all of you. Uh, we're going to have to have you all come back. Um, and please keep up the fantastic work. Uh, Laura and Ashley and Paul, thank you so much. Thank you, Brian. Um, but, thank you, Brian. Thanks. But don't leave, friends. Uh, let me just point out, um, let me thank you all for the fantastic questions that have come up. And let me just uh, uh, re-thank the uh, Paradigm Project uh, for uh, allowing these conversations to occur. Um, if you'd like to keep these conversations going about everything from the, the moral grant to what civic engagement is, we can keep doing this on social media. Um, and we can tell Laura and, uh, and uh, Ashley about it afterwards. Use the hashtag FTTE. And you can see different places of funny me on Twitter, Mastodon Threads, Blue Sky, and my blog. Uh, if you'd like to look into our previous sessions talking about everything from liberal education to labor market, just go to tinyurl.com slash FTF archive. Uh, if you'd like to look at our upcoming sessions, head to our website, the forum.futureofeducation.us, and you can see we'll have one more paradigm conversation coming up along with sessions on AI, enrollment, and reforming grading. Thank you all again for a, a great hour conversation. I'm really looking forward to posting this. I uh, hope everybody here is doing well. In the Northern Hemisphere, summer is plunging along. I hope you're all safe and sound. And we'll see you next time online. Take care. Bye-bye. <laughs>